All right, our next guest on our Hale uh, kind of mini podcast series is Will Somerville. Now, Will uh, is a test cricketer for New Zealand, and he played in the most recent test um, between Australia and New Zealand in January, plus a lot of other stuff that he's done in his quite remarkable sporting career. Joining me here are also Chris Gard and Matthew Sculthorpe, who's our first 11 cricketer. So, Will, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. No worries. So we'll just go around. We're going to start with Matt here, who we've just finished the season, actually just become joint premiers of our first 11 competition. So I'll hand over to Matt to um, say, uh, you know, to, to start the show. Hey, Will. Thanks for joining us here today. Pleasure, uh, Matt. Yeah, congratulations first question. on the premiership. That's great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a good season. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the sports you played as a teenager, both in the community and for school? Yeah, sure. I mean, I played a lot of different sports as a kid growing up. I just wanted to play all all sports, really. Um, but rugby and cricket were the two biggest ones for me. Um, massively, I was really into rugby and loved that. I had a great passion for that. played a couple of years of the first 15 at my school, which I went to with Luke Bauer, um, Mr. Bauer, and you know him as. But, um, yeah, he was 5'8 and couldn't tackle back three years before I played first 15. But... Um, yeah, we, we thankfully had a better first five when I was playing, but I um, had a bit of a success there and really loved rugby. Um, and But cricket was always a strong, strong passion of mine, and I also played like, a lot of tennis. I still play golf nowadays. Um, I'm trying to get my kids into golf as well, um, as you can play that for the rest of your life. So I think, but, um, yeah, yeah I, loved, I loved those sports, and I played for East. Uh, rugby club down the road and cricket East cricket on the weekend I play on a Sunday I played for school on a Saturday and then to the club on a Sunday and I grew up playing with, at, at East with Luke as well and quite in Grace Shield and the, the club competitions in Sydney which is where the cricket sort of becomes more more and more serious I suppose mm, Thank you and another one here playing sport for school what would be the best sporting win you were involved in and why do you think you still remember it to this day? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I had a few. I, I had to think about this when I read the questions earlier. But I think the biggest, like the, one of the most memorable wins, was playing game for the first fifteen. And we were we weren't a strong side, but we sort of won out of nowhere against the team that ended up almost winning the competition. I think in Trinity, and we won we won by one point. And but it was one of those games where we just everything we did was that intensity and that level was heightened and at the end of it when you win a, win a contest like that it's something you never forget and I was yeah we only won two games that, te- that season and that was one of them against a very strong team it was a huge upset and yeah I'll never forget that that moment at, at Trinity Ground it was away from home as well so we weren't expected to we were expected to lose by plenty but um, that, was, that was one of the great wins mm. G'day mate Chris Gard here um just, uh, well, you've obviously got a bit of a connection to Hale. You may not uh, not know about it, but um, Stuart Mead, who was our headmaster for a number of years, he actually coached you at first 15 level, I believe. What are your memories of um, Stuart as a coach and what did you learn from him? Um, yes, yeah, Stuart, oh, Mr Mead, as I knew him back then, is, yeah, he's an absolute legend at, at Cranbrook School before he moved to Hale. And I was very aware that he was at Hale for years and years. I bumped into him when I was with the New South Wales team in the Lulabar of all places and he was there I think he was interviewing for his next job actually which I think I believe he still has in Brisbane somewhere or yeah. just um, south of Brisbane but yeah I bumped into him there and like, it was just yeah, it was unreal to see him and um, he was pretty proud that I was there with New South Wales and he's one of those guys that was a huge mentor for every one of us particularly in sport um, he was just the way his values and you know how he treated everyone the same, and he was strong in his principles, and and he had a lot of respect from every single boy at the school. And he was deputy of Cranbrook for many years, and that's when I was at school as well. And then he moved on, obviously, to Hale after that to become the principal, I believe. Um, yeah, and he, he's had a hugely successful career in teaching, and you know he's a guy that yeah had so much passion, particularly with his coaching and his. His rugby coaching was like pretty awesome. I, I loved him, and he worked with Dave Oliver together as another coach. Because their passion together was uh, pretty inspirational. And 
he's one of those men that you really, I still look up to and admire for what he's achieved in his life and his career. Nice, and your, your cricketing journey, I believe, is a bit of an interesting one. You, so you left school in 2002, uh, made your test debut in 2018. I mean, that's 16 years of hard work you've had to sort of uh, smash out for a fairly long time to get your chance there. Um, can you spend a few minutes just giving us a rundown of those 16 years as a cricketer? Yeah, it's, it's been quite a long time, I suppose, and quite a long journey, like you said. But I wasn't a cricketer that whole time, so I started... I ended school when I was playing third grade out of school and I played a bit of second grade with Luke Bauer, with Lukey up, um, up the road to East. And yeah, I loved that. But my cricket wasn't really going anywhere. And I moved to Dunedin in New Zealand when I was 19, 2004. And I, yeah, played cricket there, but I went there to study as well. I did a commerce degree, which I finished. So three and a half, like four years study there. And over the summers, I played played a little bit of cricket for Otago. I debuted my first class debut for Otago was when I was 20 um, in 2005. So like sort of six months after I moved there, I moved to Africa in 2004. Yeah, and then I debuted under Glenn Turner, who was one of New Zealand's greatest batsmen of all time. He scored 100 first class hundreds, um, the first and only New Zealand to do that, I believe. And um, he's in that, he was a legend. He was Oh, almost 70, I think, when he was coaching at that time, and he gave me my chance. I made my first class debut, and then over the next four years, I played like four games for Otago, and I finished my degree. And then I went to England and played for a couple of clubs in Sussex Premier League, and then the Hertfordshire League, which is just North London. I loved that experience, like going to England. The cricket club is a huge part of their community. And, you know, it's very social, but it's also great cricket, and I learned how to that was sort of when I learned a bit more about professionalism and because you have a bit of responsibility as an overseas player over there, you've got to score runs and take wickets. So you kind of you know, treat it pretty seriously and I did that and did quite well for my, both my clubs and absolutely loved it. And then to, to 2009, that takes a little to 2009, so seven years into that, so I moved back to Sydney to be with my girlfriend Eleanor, who Luke knows well from Sydney days as well. And, um, you know, she, she even ended up becoming my wife and we've got two kids now. But we, I moved there in 2009 and I played grade cricket for East for two years and then I moved to um, Sydney University. So I was playing Sydney, Sydney first grade cricket for East and then Sydney University, which is where I had five years there. And that's when I broke into the New South Wales team when I was 30 years old, so in 2014. Um, it seems like just the other day, but it's six years ago now, which is crazy. Uh, and so I've been full-time since... Basically, I, I was, in that time I was working in Sydney as an accountant. I did my chartered accountancy along the way, so I was studying while working and playing first grade, trying to get into the New South Wales team, and then cracked it when I was 30. Like, not really thinking that it would actually happen. Like, I was hopeful for another opportunity to be a professional cricketer, and it's what I'd always dreamed of. And then suddenly I got the call, and I played a second living game for New South Wales, bowled a whole bunch of overs, and didn't take many wickets, but I did a, did a job on a flat wicket out at Blacktown, of all places, and Phil Jakes was my coach um, for second eleven then, and um, Trent Johnson, and then Trevor Bayless rang me like a week later, and I was in the. Oh, it was Greg Mail who rang me originally because he was my first grade captain at Sydney University, a guy who's an absolute legend of Sydney grade cricket, and a, a tremendous man and a great guy, um, a good friend. And Maylie rang me first, and or he announced it at the end of one first grade game that I was going to play the next Shield game at the MCG. And I'm just like, holy shit, this is happening! Amazing. Um, yeah, so played at the MCG on debut, um, and yeah, I didn't take a wicket. I think I was none for 114 in the first innings, and yeah, didn't. I was like, oh shit! But I held off an end. It sort of felt like I contributed something. They scored like 480. Um, for five declared or something like Dave Hussey, 100, Hanscom, 100, um, I think Spoinis might have got 100 as well, with three guys got 100s, but it was a bit of a tough debut, but, um, you yeah, know, then played the next game in Adelaide. It was, it was a pink ball game. Mitchell Stark was playing, steaming in at the other end, and I'm bowling Malfi's down the other end, and Akeef's playing, and I'm like, fire, I'm surrounded by these guys who are like, um, genuine cricket professionals and I'm just kind of getting into it and that was a very memorable game because we won it and Nick Larkin got his first first class 100 he was my teammate at Sydney Uni so all these like great memories from the, the start of my career to do. Um, and that was yeah, that was it and then I just took off from there I suppose they showed faith in me and gave me a contract for the next year 
Um, and then that flowed on, and I didn't really play as much as I would have liked for New South Wales. Over the four seasons, I had I played 12 games, and but when I did play, I did well, and that was very important in the way you prepare and um, get ready for a game of professional cricket. Mm-hmm. That's all you can do. The only control is your pre- preparation, and that's um, what I've sort of focused on since I became a professional cricketer, just giving it everything and making sure that I'm ready to play and I can do what I can do, trusting yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, then, so Will, so that, that then it, you know, I mean, there was a time that you made a decision to move back to New Zealand, you know, I mean, uh, I think yeah. around about 2017 and that was a bit of a gamble because you, you moved your whole family, you relocated again from Sydney um, to Auckland, yeah. I believe, to, to see if you could realise your dream of playing test cricket and that came yeah. true December 2018, so about, you know, 17 yeah. months ago that you picked on a tour of the um, UAE, I think, to play Pakistan, um, and then yeah. were picked to make your test debut uh, as a test cricketer. Now, if we were to fast forward to that moment, how exactly did you find out you were in that 11, and what did that feel like after that whole journey you just described? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, it was pretty extremely emotional. I, yeah, I vaguely remember. So I was in the UAE for like, probably four weeks before that. So I was 12th man for the first two tests in Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and then we back to Abu Dhabi. So I was 12th man for a couple of games. So I kind of got in, into the team environment, into the group, and I'd be bowling heaps and trying to prepare as if I was going to maybe hopefully play that last test. And then it obviously occurred. Um, uh, that was super exciting, um, to say the least. And, yeah, it was incredibly emotional. After all those years of you know, playing cricket and playing seriously and hoping that one day I'd you know, be a professional cricketer and then to play for my country, New Zealand, was, um, yeah, it was amazing. And, yeah, Abu Dhabi was a pretty, it was a pretty sort of desolate place, really. Like, you're in the middle of the desert and there's a stadium and there's maybe a thousand Pakistani fans there singing songs and stuff. But um, my parents were there for the first test there, but they didn't, they went home, so they missed the third test. Okay. Um, but it was an incredible series to win. And, yeah, like, I'll never forget. Okay. Matt? You know, the, uh, so New Zealand went on to win that test, and I think the series from memory. Uh, what was it like celebrating that victory, the series victory? Uh, it was a lot of fun, yeah. We, uh, from memory, we, <clears throat> we ended up staying up pretty late and having a great night, but then we, we had a 5 a.m. bus the next day, so it was a bit of a nightmare on that bus ride. We were still singing songs and, and having a good time on the way to the airport um, to fly home, but yeah. <clears throat> Certainly, the, it was a great win for New Zealand cricket. The first time in 69 years that we'd, that we'd won a, a series in Pakistan or away against Pakistan. Anyway, it wasn't in Pakistan, but yeah, yeah. pretty special time to, to be a part of the team. Yeah. Now, if we move forward to January, this just gone, you know, I mean, pre coronavirus, mm. um, you were picked, you know, in New Zealand's Tour of Australia and you played at the SCG, your home ground. Um, and it's, you know, that's obviously where you described you spent most of your childhood here um, and you were walking out to represent your country against the likes of New South Wales teammates that you had, Steve Smith, Dave Warner, Mitchell Stark, Pat Cummins, Nathan Lyon. Um, tell me about that test. Like the SCG, one of the most hallowed sporting venues, you know, in, 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 the, in the world for cricket and those five days of your life. What was, what was that whole experience like? Uh, well, it was a massive whirlwind again, and I was playing 2020 cricket in New Zealand and got called into a test team, so I flew out, trained for two days in Sydney, and then, yeah, was ready to play, playing in the SCG, and the anthems came on, and I had Elle, Ellie, my wife, and my parents were there, and my two kids, and as the anthem came on, I was like, yeah, I was like bawling in fear, it's just like, what the hell's happening, this is crazy, it was unbelievable few days and things didn't really go to plan in the test match um, it was a pretty tough one for us but Australia were on a bit of a roll and as everyone knows in, uh, on a roll it's pretty hard to stop um, and we sort of never really gained any momentum in the match but just to be in Sydney and with a lot of my Cranbrook friends um, I had a huge amount of support there like that was it was, a, it was a bit of a homecoming in many ways and it was a very very special um, test to be a part of despite the result like I'll never forget that 
Uh, Will, we, we talk a fair bit at Hale about what it takes to be a, um, a good team player. Uh, do you remember a player, either past or present, that um, is a really good team man that you've been associated with, and what was it that made that person so special? Yeah, I think this is a really good question because there's, a, there's an, obviously leadership's made up of all different types of people. Um, but, uh, yeah, the key, and if you're a part of the New Zealand, the Black Cats set up, it's kind of a non-negotiable and pretty much every professional team, good professional team, that, and well, unfortunately I've been a part of all of them. You've got to be a team man, otherwise you don't really get anywhere. Like, really, you can be selfish in a, a certain way in the way you prepare, but as long as you're trying to give to the team, you're not going to survive. Um, so that's that's the first point. But I, I think one of the, the great team men in my New South Wales setup was um, Ben Rora, who's a guy from Fairfield, Liverpool, um, cricketer, left-handed batsman, really talented guy, and just, from my point of view, really quiet, humble, quiet achiever, got a great cricketer, and a guy everyone had a lot of respect for, Whenever we spoke and he'd listened to him, but he also kind of held the team together despite not being a captain. He was, you know, that strong sort of leadership and he was a real team guy. Um, yeah, he's probably the best example that I can make in the professional environment I've been in. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, another, obviously, in the current corona environment, the, um, you know, a lot of boys are probably facing hurdles. It might be, you know, family struggling uh, financially, medical issues, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things there. Um, you know, do you re- is there a particular period of your professional career where you know things were a little bit rough and they had a few hurdles to overcome? I mean, we've heard a little bit about that. Um, you know, your career already, and it wasn't obviously smooth sailing like you know some people are. Um, and then I suppose part B of that question, you know, do you have any advice for these guys during this time? You know, to try and overcome some of the hurdles that they may be facing. Yeah, absolutely. I think well, the hardest thing, I suppose, I never really had much opportunity as a young person so I had to have a perspective of well I'm going to keep doing it because I love doing it and keep trying to improve my own game um, and just contributing to a team and enjoying the game that way like that's that's why we all start playing sport is because we want to be part of a team that's successful and have a good time together um, so having that perspective throughout I think up until I was 30 when everything really changed that's kind of all I wanted to do was just enjoy myself and contribute and still trying to make yourself better as you've got to try and do every day when you get out of bed like make myself a better cricketer make myself a better person and then yeah you, you sort of take that into your into my cricketing life um, yeah the biggest challenges I had have always been to do the selection I think and the disappointment around that and that's something that you can't control so it's something I've learned along the way you know you can't pretend to think what selectors are thinking you've just got to control what I can control and like I said earlier about my preparation for games and I've worked out a formula that I know works for me, making sure I'm super fit and I've got the overs under my belt and I've been hitting ball in the nets and just making sure my, I mean, that takes me into a game really clear and I just trust, I can trust myself in my preparation so that I know I'll perform the best I can because I've prepared well and that's all I can control really. Um, of course you want to be selected in every team but it's not always the case and it's not it often doesn't feel like a meritocracy at times and that's the hardest part to deal with so that's when you just go i just try and look at myself in the mirror and say well what can i do better yeah oh, that's good stuff mate now I want to go to a lighter note and i'll probably speak on behalf of your friends that you know i mean your your fashion sense is not great you know, in in terms, you know, and I think that's uh, it's a long held opinion yeah. of you and yeah. people that know you. Birkenstocks. Now, obviously, you live in New Zealand. We're in Western Australia. I've found since I moved here, you know, I mean, they were, you know, in the last supper kind of sandals. There's a bit of a craze of them over here in Perth. Like, do you have a view on them, and do you wear them, and do you think they're appropriate to be worn in public? <laughs> yeah, I don't wear them, but I have. A lot of teammates are wear them, and they've unfortunately the craze has arrived here as well, Luki. But they're very popular and within my Auckland cricket team and my club team here, and yeah, they're, they're everywhere, mate. And they're I think they're here to stay, so we've got to embrace them. Yeah, we can only hope that uh, Scomo puts that as part of the restrictions in his next update. Yeah, um, I don't think he makes any decisions, mate. Yeah. <laughs> um, last one. 
how do you eat your meat pie? And I'll, I'll give you a bit of background here. So our boarders on Tuesdays have pie day and our boarders do really strange things to pies. They lift the lids off, they put sauce in the middle, they eat them with forks and spoons and knives. It's a bit disconcerting to the adults that have a bit of maturity on campus. How does Will Somerville eat a pie? I don't eat pies, man. I'm a first-time athlete. Okay, so let's cut through that nonsense. Okay, I'm going to ask the question one more time, and I need the re- real answer now. How does Will Somerville eat pies? I literally, I just pour, I put sauce all over the top of the lid, and then I just put it in my hand and chow down. I don't have much, there's not much science to it, and from my point of view, sometimes I put a hole in it just to see how hot it is, just to let the air come out, and then I'll cover it in sauce and eat it. You put, what do you mean you put a hole in it? Where? where? In the bottom no, or the side? In the roof. Put a hole in the roof, put your finger in to make sure it's not too hot. Um, your finger in? Or if it gets over, Finger in, make it's sure you've got some hand sanitizer on that. You put your finger in the middle of the pie. That's actually, that's, yeah, we might have to edit this it's question also, out. Like, that's going to. If it's a frozen one, if you put your finger in it, it's still cold in the middle, you've got to reheat it. So. Okay, okay. Well, I'm not going to try that, but and I hope, you know, I mean, those hail boys at home listening to this, you don't put your fingers in pies. It's not, uh, that's not great. Anyway, Will, I'm going to let you go. Yeah. All right, I'm going to um, let you go, mate. Really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Um, make sure you, family, stay safe next coming weeks, and we'll hope to see you back uh, representing New Zealand shortly. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Thanks, Luigi. Thanks. All right, thanks, mate. see ya. Cheers. Bye, Will. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Bye. Okay.